Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to our course Physical Chemistry 101. My name is Dr. Lauf and today's topic is how to express the change of a system in numbers. We have discussed how to describe the state of a system in numbers. It takes the number of the components, the number of the phases and a certain number of state variables. Now we want to change the state of our system. Let's consider a homogeneous system composed of identical particles. This is a one phase, one component system. According to Gibbs phase rule, we need two and only two state variables to describe it. For instance, temperature and pressure. The substitute i refers to these variables in the initial state. So we start with single phase, single component system, clearly defined by pressure and temperature. Now we want to change the state by varying one or more state variables. For example, we can heat up the system at constant volume to a certain extent. Just imagine a tin can on a hot plate. Then we get a different temperature and a different pressure. Tf for T final and Pf for pressure final. To describe this state change in numbers, we need to specify the changes of the state variables of temperature and pressure. This is usually expressed by a delta in thermodynamics. Delta V is final value of the state variable minus the initial value of the state variable. So delta P equals P final minus P initial. Delta T equals T final minus T initial. Delta V equals V final minus V initial. Well, this delta would be equal to zero in this process. Delta rho is rho final minus rho initial and so on and so on. The changes of the state variables, delta z, can be positive or negative. For the calculation is always final value minus initial value. In physical chemistry, any change of states, like this one, is called a thermodynamic process. Thermodynamicists uh, are especially interested in the energetics of processes. Classical thermodynamics only deals with the description of the initial state and the final state of the process. It doesn't care about the time a process takes. You won't find the variable time in any thermodynamic law. In this sense, thermodynamics is really a timeless science. Reaction rate with time being the most important variable, is the realm of chemical kinetics, another branch of physical chemistry. An important question in thermodynamics is, does a given change of states occur? Do the laws of thermodynamics allow for this process? And if so, if thermodynamics gave the go, kinetics asked further, how fast is the process? To completely describe a process requires not only to indicate the deltas, the changes of state variables, but also the indication of energy transfer variables, the so-called process variables, heat, Q, and work, W. It's important to point out that heat and work are not state variables. Heat and work are not properties of a system. In a thermodynamical description, this volume of air has got mass, it's got temperature, it's got pressure, but it neither has got heat nor work. Heat and work are always associated with changes of states. So that's why they're called process variables. An important difference between the process variables here above the arrow 
and the changes of the state variables below the arrow, the deltas, is the path dependence of the process variables. To illustrate this, let's look at the four gaseous CO2 states we discussed last time. In our phase diagram, these states can be visualized as points on the PVT surface. If we go from 1 to 2 and keep the temperature constant, we move on the path drawn in red. If we go from 2 to 3 and keep the pressure constant, we move on the green path. And if we move from 3 to 4, we again move on a path of constant temperature. We call all paths of constant temperature isotherms. We call paths of constant pressure isobars. We call paths of constant volume, such as between 2 and 4, isocars. We can get from 1 to 4 in many different ways. For example, we may move from 1 via 2 to 4 or from 1 via 3 to 4, or from 1 via 2 and 3 to 4. In terms of delta P, the pressure difference between 1 and 4, the path does not matter. All changes of state variables are path independent. It makes no difference which way we go, which way we perform the process. This does not hold for process variables. It may well be that the work on the path 1, 2, 4 is different from the work on path 1, 3, 4. In terms of work and heat, you always have to specify the exact path. Path makes no difference for state variables. Discussing process variables, specification of the path is essential. Specification of the path is often given by the state variable which is held constant during the process. We speak of an isothermic or an isobaric path. Well, but there is another very important specification of the path from the initial state to the final state. Thermodynamicists often refer to processes on a reversible path or an irreversible path. Let me give you an example of what this refers to. After having compressed the volume of air to half, I let the air expand to its initial value. Compressing to half, expanding to initial value. Initial state, final state. In the expansion process, the gas expands and in principle it should be possible to gain work by this process. In fact, this is a key process in any internal combustion engine. The point is that the work that I can gain by this process very much depends on the path. Consider the clearly defined initial state, the compressed state, and the final state, the expanded state. In fact, I may move in many different ways from initial to final. If we carry out this process of expansion in a vacuum, that is, in an environment in which the pressure is zero, then the system expands but the piston exerts no force. And if there is no force, there is no work. This expansion path is very fast, but without gaining any work. W equals zero, that's what thermodynamicists call a spontaneous process. As the ability of doing work has been at least partly wasted, this process is called irreversible. In fact, no work has been gained at all. The useful work is equal to zero. The process is not reversible. The system won't spontaneously move back to the initial state. Irreversible. Uh, we can modify 
the experiment, more precisely, redo the experiment and alter the path. Note that we may not modify the initial and final state as they define our process. We try to carry out the process in such a way that the volume expansion will be associated with the lifting of a weight. In this case, a certain amount of work, namely the gravitational work, is obtained by the expansion. To gain the maximum possible amount of work, we have to construct an apparatus which ensures permanent pressure equilibrium between outside and inside, between surroundings and system. When the piston moves to the right, the weight is lifted and the maximum amount of work is recovered. Note that this is a limiting case. Equal pressure on the right hand and the left hand side of the piston. Paths that permanently move at equilibrium obtain the maximal possible work and are called reversible paths. The process is reversible because this maximum amount of work we gain and save as gravitational work is sufficient to compress the system to its initial state without changing anything else in the surroundings. The reversible path is the opposite of the spontaneous path. Note that for the same process the amount of gained work may vary between zero spontaneous and a maximum value reversible. Therefore, it is important to always specify the exact path of a process when discussing heat and work. As you may have noticed, an important concept in thermodynamics is equilibrium. In fact, classical thermodynamics is concerned exclusively with equilibrium state systems in a state showing no change over time. If I measure a state variable, say temperature, now and after a certain time, and I realize the value has not changed, the system is apparently in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium to be exact. When I look at two separate subsystems with different temperatures, then I may state that first each system is in equilibrium with itself, but when I bring them into thermal contact, then I see changes over time. Over time, the temperatures of the two systems will adjust. In the end, there will be a uniform temperature throughout, and we have equilibrium. We move from thermal disequilibrium to thermal equilibrium. If we want to express the disequilibrium in numbers, then we may take the difference in temperature as a measure for the distance or the gap of the initial systems from thermal equilibrium. Consider two subsystems with a high and a low pressure. Initially, each system is in equilibrium with itself. When I bring the systems into contact and allow for pressure changes, opening a valve, will do. Pressures will change over time. When eventually this change over time stops, the system has reached equilibrium. The pressure difference is a measure of the distance, the gap of the initial system from pressure equilibrium. In thermodynamics, it is possible to figure out chemical equilibria in a similar way. Consider a reactant NO2 and the product N2O4. Thermodynamics defines a state variable, the chemical potential mu, which allows for a statement on the distance of the reaction mixture from chemical equilibrium. If reactants and products are not in equilibrium, the chemical potentials of the reactant and the product will be different. There may be a reaction in one or the other way, and in equilibrium the chemical potentials of reactants and products will be the same. So thermodynamics has fulfilled its mission to quantitatively express thermal equilibrium, pressure equilibrium, 
and chemical equilibrium in numbers. Note that defining equilibrium as temporal change equal to zero or steady state is not sufficient. There must be a further condition to be met. If there is a real equilibrium situation, when we disturb or disrupt the equilibrium, for instance, uh, increase temperature slightly, then the system will move to a different equilibrium. And if we then take back this disruption, then the system will move right back to the original starting equilibrium. This is a necessary condition for a real thermodynamic equilibrium. After the disruption, the original equilibrium must be restored again. Therefore, an explosive gas mixture of hydrogen and oxygen is not in equilibrium. Also, its state does not change in time. Also, it can be stored indefinitely. But if I disrupt the system, maybe with a spark, it is obvious that the oxyhydrogen was not in equilibrium, because the change that occurs will no longer be undone if I take away the spark. Using the term thermal equilibrium, the concept of temperature is defined. In fact, this is the so-called Vero's law of thermodynamics. If system A is in thermal equilibrium with the system B, and system B is also in thermal equilibrium with system C, then it follows that system A is also in thermal equilibrium with system C. This may sound trivial, but it is in fact important for a clear definition of temperature. Imagine system B being a thermometer. A thermometer only makes sense if the zero's law holds. If A and B are in thermal equilibrium and B and C are in thermal equilibrium, all three systems have the same temperature. The zero's law is sometimes called the equipartition theorem. The thermal energy is distributed evenly across the whole system. Let's summarize today's lecture. The transition from a state I to a state F we call a process. We quantitatively characterize a process by specifying the state variable changes, delta Z, delta P, delta T, delta V, etc. Furthermore, we characterize the process by specifying the process variables, Q, and W, work and heat. Unlike state variable changes, the process variables are dependent on the path and we need to specify the path on which we have moved from the initial state to the final state. Paths can, for example, isothermal, isobaric, isochoric paths. If the path is reversible, then the maximum amount of work is obtained. With irreversible paths, part of the ability of doing work is wasted. With spontaneous paths, the useful work will be zero. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again.